it's no fun when our kids are sick, but we may just have found the silver lining. Apple and raspberry and orange flavoured electrolyte slushies made by Rehydrate. Rehydrate slushies are a tasty way to get essential electrolytes into our little ones when they're dehydrated from sickness or even just the Aussie heat. They're delicious and they'll help your little ones feel better in no time. Grab Rehydrate from Coles today. It's the Happy Families Podcast. It's the podcast for the time poor parent who just wants answers now. When we get curious, not furious, we move towards the issue that's causing us the consternation, but we do so in a graceful way. And now here's the stars of our show, my mum and dad. Hello, this is Dr. Justin Coulson, the author of uh, six books, nearly forgot how many there were, uh, about raising happy families. I'm here with my wife and co-host, Mrs. Happy Families, uh, Kylie, mum to our six daughters. You're sounding a bit flat today, my honey. Oh, no, I'm not trying to sound flat. Uh, I'm actually doing okay. Although I, I have got a little bit of a, um, like, I mean, we, this is the Happy Families podcast. It's for people to feel good about life. But, but you know, something has gotten in my craw over the last little bit. Uh, you know, I, we've got about 170,000 people who follow us on Facebook. That's a very big community to keep uh, tabs on. And, and normally we've got a really supportive, really positive community. But just recently, there's been a couple of social media moments that have really been challenging for me. And it's kind of a, a bit of a tough one because, like, if you follow somebody, it's because you like them, right? But every now and again, I'll post something and somebody won't like what I've posted. And all of a sudden, it turns into this, oh, I'm unfollowing and I've got to delete you and cancel culture. You know, we're cancelling uh, we're canceling you, we're cancelling your Facebook page, that kind of mentality. I don't really quite know how to articulate exactly what, to say, what I want to say, but I had a post go up uh, not too long ago and it was related to something that I teach really explicitly. It's based on decades of social and evolutionary psychology research, but it's actually based on millennia of what it is to be human. And what I posted was this really simple phrase, high emotions, low intelligence. That is, when we get into situations where we or our children get really, really emotional, what happens is our intelligence goes out the window. We behave less intelligently, less rationally, less well-considered and usually less favorably when our emotions are really high. That makes sense, right? Yeah. And there's loads of neuroscience, there's brain scan imagery, there's all kinds of things that will emphasize this. In fact, uh, I, I'm not going to show off, I'm going to keep it really simple. But basically, there's parts of the brain that look after planning and thinking. And uh, we, we call that uh, mainly in our prefrontal cortex. That's the bit above your eyes, behind your forehead. That's where our brain's executive is. Now, there are other parts of the brain that are involved in this thinking as well. But when something happens and we want to kind of map out what's the best way forward here, that's the part of the brain that we use the most. And then in the middle of our brains, like if you drilled right between your ears all the way through, just above that drill line, right in the center of your brain, there's this thing called the limbic system. And it has a whole lot of brain neuroanatomy, like uh, the amygdala. You've probably heard of having an amygdala mm. override. That's the the fear, the anger response, the whoa, you know, alarm, warning, Will Robinson, it's all about to happen, the fight or flight mode. Uh, and, and what happens in brain scans is when we get people into uh, something of, a, of an emotional state, the blood flows away from the thinking parts of the brain and towards the emotional parts of the brain. I know you've been so angry with me sometimes. <laughs> the the angrier you are, the more right you are, right? Yeah. And and, and you become, and you feel more justified to feel the way you do. And, and and you'll you'll tell me things when you're angry that seem right to you in the moment, but when you've calmed down, they don't seem quite so right anymore. Because your intelligence returns and you start to think a little bit more broadly. You start to think a bit more laterally. You start to remember stuff that you couldn't remember in the heat of the moment. I'm saying you, but of course, I'm as guilty as anyone. It happens to all of us. It's part of being a human. So I've posted this thing, high emotions, low intelligence, and there was just this huge disagreement, uh, but it but it got very personal. It's almost like everybody who read it that disagreed with it, for whatever reason, I don't know. I mean, I, I do know that some people interpreted it incorrectly. Some people thought that I was saying that if you're an emotional person, you can't be an intelligent person, which is not the intent. And there was a link to a blog and it explained exactly why it said what it said. Uh, but what I'm finding is that when people come up against something that conflicts with their worldview, Instead of doing that thing that I always talk about, get curious, not furious, 
They do exactly the opposite. They get furious. They blow up. And and any disagreement becomes an opportunity to cancel someone or to um, dive into your own echo chamber and recruit as many people as you can to your side so that you can prove that you're right and the others are wrong. And in a world that says that it's all about uh, being pluralistic and tolerating, in fact, encouraging diversity and being open-minded. Inclusive. Social media may be the least inclusive least tolerant place that we could be on the planet unless you align with a particular view at a particular time for a particular reason for a particular person. Drives me crazy. I I just love to be open-minded and to be curious about things. And I'm having a moment. I've been having a moment for a bit over this. I had an experience probably maybe 15 years ago, and it has literally changed the way I see social media. There was barely social media then. I think Facebook came out about 15 years ago. Yeah, I I wasn't on there very long and I didn't post for very long. Early adopter. Because what happened was one of my friends put a post up. She was having an absolute meltdown because she couldn't get her kids to do homework. So she's a really good friend of mine and she knew exactly how we felt, what our philosophy was about homework. And so because I wanted to be brief in my response, I just said to her, let go of homework. You know, what the teachers can't get done today, they'll do tomorrow. Yeah. And we're going to do a podcast on homework soon because it's such a hot button issue. But social media might blow up when we do that as well. Anyway, so what happened with your story? Within seconds, one of her friends who I don't know got on and absolutely went to town at me. And it's so personal, isn't it? Like, And it's almost like any social graces. In fact, that's a really interesting word to use. There is no grace afforded to somebody when they step outside of what somebody else perceives they should say. There's no grace. There's no forgiveness. There's no, you know, Justin, we've seen you post a million posts that have helped our family. Uh, and we don't agree with you on this one, but uh, we're going to stick with you. This is like, we don't care about your last million posts. You've lost us right now. Just, it does my head in. Yeah. No matter what I said to this woman, it actually just got worse and yeah. then other people joined in. And all of a sudden I was in this position where I was being judged for literally <laughs> two little lines. A couple of sentences, yeah. Without any context whatsoever. And I had to ring my friend and apologize profusely. I felt terrible that this had now implicated her. She then explained to me that the person who was responding to me was a teacher who feels hard done by in the state system and feels, you know, kind of very poorly supported by parents and the education department. And is defensive and probably wants to be heard and have a voice. And, and I get that there's two sides to all of this. What I'm really astounded by, I, I actually want to ask you a couple of questions about that and see how much it resonates and corresponds with my experience. But what I'm finding is that people have to be right. There's just this degree of certainty, this absolutism that I find I'm really uncomfortable with. Like I, I know I get paid to share what the research says and people really appreciate the books and the things that we share in this podcast, but I'm not really certain about much of it. That, that's the reality. And as a scientist, I've been trained to not be certain about things. In fact, as research scientists, we're trained to be skeptical of everything and to seek as much evidence as we can. And that's why I'll usually catch what I'm saying is, you know, on average, what we see, or it really depends, but what we might expect in usual circumstances, because you just never know. But people want absolutism, ab- unquestioned clarity and definite responses like homework's good or homework's bad. Well, no, it depends what kind of homework. It depends how old the child is. We'll, we'll talk about that, like I said, later. And it sounds like that's your experience. Now, I've got a question for you. When this was happening, were you able to walk away from the argument? Were you able to put your phone down and just leave it be? No, I felt physically ill. It was like someone had physically assaulted me. Yeah. It, it was it was all encompassing. It took up all of my headspace. And probably all of your afternoon or evening or whatever it was. Yeah, I was a mess. I couldn't function properly because all of a sudden, everything I knew about myself was being questioned. I was being attacked. I was being attacked just for having an opinion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is kind of my point. Now, I could not get away from the phone. I was having a bad day and I saw all these messages coming through. I mean, there were literally hundreds of messages coming through. Some were very, very supportive. Some were exactly the opposite. Some were vitriolic. Really, really, really nasty. And I just sat there and thought, 
I'm actually here trying to help. Like my job, my, my, my life is built around inspiring and helping and making a difference in people's lives. And what I've shared does make sense and it's got strong empirical support. It's not like I've just pulled this idea out of the air and chucked it on the internet like several other people do. I mean, I, they're, they're everywhere. Um, this, this, is a, this is a really clear scientific reality and human reality. And yet that, that, that statement that high emotions leads to low intelligence, it seemed to actually bear itself out in the <laughs> comments section as people got more and more emotional. But, but I found myself becoming more emotional and I started thinking to myself, I want to reply to them and tell them exactly how I feel, which would have been a very unintelligent thing to do. And it took a lot of restraint for me to not do that. And I'm not that kind of guy. But that got me thinking. If that's what happens to you, you know, a mature woman getting used to social media a decade or more ago, me, a guy with a PhD in psychology who literally teaches people how to not get caught up in this stuff and to deal with it much more effectively, what must it be like for a 14-year-old girl or boy or an 11-year-old, you know, for a child who is encountering this perhaps for the first time in their lives now that they've finally been allowed to get that Facebook account or that Instagram account or the Snapchat or TikTok account, what must it be like for them to have to encounter this kind of challenge, this kind of adversity and pressure? And I want to talk about what we can do as parents in that circumstance and tie it back to this issue that we've both faced right after the break. It's the Happy Families Podcast. Are screens creating tension at home? Tweens, Teens and Screens is a webinar to guide families to healthy, safe, super screen solutions. Buy it today at happyfamilies.com.au slash shop. The kids are back at school, after school activities are starting and we are once again organising how to get our kids to and from it all. So has the old should I or shouldn't I give them a mobile phone debate began in your head? Well, Space Talk offers the perfect solution with their newly released Adventurer, a 4G smartphone watch. Designed especially for 5 to 12 year olds, the new Adventurer watch features phone calls, SMS messaging and GPS location updates, giving parents and kids a safe age appropriate way to stay connected. Our 10-year-old has one and we love that she has it and she loves having one. You can check out spacetalkwatch.com to find out how you can give yourself and your child the peace of mind that you're never far away. It's the Happy Families Podcast, the podcast for the time poor parent who just wants answers now. And today we have been talking about what we can do and how we can work through challenges when social media just blows up in our face. Yeah, when it goes Kaput or kapow or whatever it has. And, and, and we've both had that experience and it happened to me fairly recently. And, and I'm actually really tender about it. I don't know if it's because I was just having a really rough day anyway. I mean, I don't have too many bad days. I, I think that I live one of the most wonderful. I, I love my life. I love my family. I feel like we've got a great life, but this just, man, this just threw me so far and so hard. Well, let's face it. It's not the first time it's happened. There have been lots of times where people have disagreed. Yeah, but with- I'm, I, I'm good with disagreement. I love disagreement, not because I, I, I don't like conflict and unkindness, but I love disagreement because it can often lead to learning with the right mindset. I wonder if what we're experiencing more is just the fact that, you know, when somebody um, opens up a post You've got an explanation, right? But they're looking at the image and the image has four words. Yeah, high emotions it. equals low intelligence. That's and, the four words. And instead of reading what's going on, they see this image and it's like walking in halfway through a conversation or just overhearing a snippet of a conversation. And so it's completely taken out of context and as a result, our response is completely out of content. So this is the podcast for the time poor parent who just wants answers now. So let's talk about answers for a sec. That is situation that you've described is is a great description of what's probably going on. But one of the things that I teach explicitly and ongoingly is get curious, not furious. Now, I admit I didn't actually get too curious either. I was pretty defensive. I was pretty tender. It had been a lousy day. I've emphasized that sufficiently. But nobody else was curious. There was no hint of that statement strikes me as uh, inconsistent with what I believed, or you seem to feel really strongly about that. Can you help me to understand more? You know, when our children are having a hard time, that's exactly what I encourage parents to do. Uh, the other day, we had a child who refused to go to swimming lessons, and my response to her was, Emily, can you help me to understand what it is about swimming lessons that you don't like? She calmed down straight away, and she said, oh, sure, Dad, I don't like my teacher. I said, ah, so if we can work out the teacher problem, do you think that you'll be okay with swimming lessons? She said, yep. 
And, and that was kind of it. And I said, okay, well, we'll do that. Today you're still going to have to go to swimming. And then she blew up again. <laughs> but, but when we get curious, not furious, we move towards the issue that's causing us the consternation, but we do so in a in a graceful way. We do so in a way that says, Justin, I've been following you on social media for a while and I know that if you say something provocative, then there's probably something behind it that I'm missing right now. Maybe I can just read your article or ask you a couple of questions and I can understand it better. What did you mean when you said that? Now, I'm never going to respond with frustration to a response like that and our children don't. You don't want to, that's a different setup. Yeah, I, I'm just I'm just thinking about it in in the real world, you know, tangible, real world. Are you saying that I'm not real world? <laughs> no, no, no. I'm t- taking it outside of, you know, technology and social media context. In the real world, is there actually any one person that you associate with where you just absolutely agree with everything they do and say? No. It, it doesn't no. exist. Yeah. And if we were sitting down opposite a, at one another at a table, we'd work it out. Well, but you and I, I mean, we love each other. We live with each other. We do everything together. And yet we have really different views on some things. And that is normal and healthy. And yet when we get onto social media, we kind of expect that everybody's going to be exactly like us for some reason. And and if somebody has a strong opinion, we all kind of jump on the bandwagon. We, it's like, it's like we yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of following going on yeah. for ourselves and, and we just kind of get caught up in the emotion of it. Mm. The pile on begins. That actually kind of leads into the second take-home message that I want parents to get from this, whether they're getting caught up in it in any kind of interaction themselves or whether the kids are caught up in any kind of dramas and challenges. And that is that I don't think that when we're on screens, our hearts turn towards one another in the same way that they do when we're face-to-face. When I'm sitting down with somebody who is an adversary, somebody that I disagree with, and we're face-to-face, we're at a table or we're, we're sharing a walk through a park as we try to iron out our differences, what can normally happen is we start to see one another as people and our hearts are designed to be open to the other person, to listen to perspectives and try to understand. We give people the benefit of the doubt You know, it's interesting when you were saying that, I remember a number of times with our children over the years where they've had, you know, falling outs with their friends and they've tried Mm. to make phone calls and the phone has been ignored or they've sent Sent a a text message and it's gone nowhere. And so- either you or I have actually put them in the car and taken them to their friend's house. And <laughs> Knocked inevitably, on the door. <laughs> as soon as they've seen each other, yeah. there has been an absolute emotional outpouring as they have just realised that this is all silly and they just want to be friends. And And what happened at school in the playground today is really not important, but it would never have happened if they were not face-to-face. It would have continued. So I think that they're my two key take-home messages. Number one, get curious, not furious. You don't need to attack people. And please don't attack me. <laughs> There's a bit of self-interest here, but, but really, uh, get curious, not furious. And the second thing, imagine if we could turn our hearts towards the other person, give them the benefit of the doubt, and think to yourself, hang on, I've clicked like and follow on this person's social media profile. Therefore, they're adding some value to my life. What's to be gained by attacking them? What's to be gained by being belligerent or rude to them? Maybe we can humanize the person that we're about to go to war with and wonder if perhaps war is not the best answer. We're much more likely to help people come to our way of thinking if we treat them like a human rather than as our foe, the person we need to defeat. There's one more thing that I think we really need to touch on though for for every parent of a child who has access to social media. I just can't imagine what it must be like for a child. I couldn't stop it as a PhD in psychology. You couldn't stop it as a mature mum going through this kind of uh, challenging thing. And I've heard the horror stories. I've, I've spoken to so many parents who are heartbroken because their children have wound up in flaming Uh, firestorms of tweets and accusations or arguments over text message or in group chats on Instagram or uh, whatever, whatever it might be, watching this happen and their kids just can't get away from it in the same way that I couldn't get away from it when this was all blowing up for me. Uh, I, I, it's a very sensitive topic, but I'm aware of one 14 year old who suicided and at least in part, this was because of the terror of being left alone 
with the bullies who just wouldn't leave her alone. I think as parents, we've got to be able to have the wisdom because we're not in the moment, the wisdom to say to our children, this is awful. Right now we just need to take a few screenshots of the horrible things that are going on and then we need to get out of the conversation, turn the phone off and just have a day and a night with no devices. Because once you convinced me to put my phone down and it took me a while, I knew that you were right, by the way. You said, put it down, stop it, come on, give me the phone. And eventually I handed it over. It took a long time. But once I did it, I, I all, almost immediately began to feel more peaceful. And then I was able to connect with you and we were able to talk about what was going on and then talk about something completely irrelevant so that we could kind of let it go. And it made all the difference. If you're a parent who's going through it, don't let your child become a horror story. I know how, how sensitive I became in the moment. If I was a 14, 13, 12-year-old girl or boy, I suspect that it could have been devastating, maybe even catastrophic. So I guess to just summarise, we've talked about a lot of things today and there's been, you know, th- this has been a really sensitive topic for you. The three take-homes for today are one, get curious, not furious. Number two, turn our hearts towards one another. Yeah, give, give people the benefit of the doubt. Be charitable. It's okay to be kind. And number three, if your children or you are caught up in this, just get away from the screen. Great summary. Um, if you've enjoyed the podcast, a bit of a different one for what, from what we normally do, but hopefully this has been helpful. Uh, and I don't know, maybe it even gives you a bit of an insight into some of the stuff that you know we deal with on a, an occasional basis as well. If you've enjoyed the podcast, we encourage you to share it with your friends. Jump onto Apple Podcasts, leave us a rating and review. We love the five-star ratings and reviews, uh, and it makes me feel especially good after after an episode like this or a day like this. So please, uh, not that I'm after sympathy votes or anything, but uh, we love your five-star ratings and reviews. They help people to find the podcast and boost it in the rankings so that more people can make their families happier. We appreciate Justin Rulon from Bridge Media for making the podcast sound great. He's our producer. Our executive producer is Craig Bruce. And if you'd like more info about how to make your family happier, please visit happyfamilies.com.au. Listener.